I'd like to do a, a 10 things about me video. I don't know 10 things about me. What the hell am I supposed to do? 10 things about me? Jesus. God, the, the person behind the gamer that's... Oh, what am I gonna do? This is crazy. I don't know anything. 10 things about me. Ah, I don't know anything. I am almost 53. I'm a Manifros veteran and I'm disabled. My wife died a little over a year ago, so I'm the 52 year old disabled widower. United States Air Force medical pot using veteran. Not only that, I stay home and I game all day and I love hamsters. You know what that means? No matter what. I am the internet's dorky grandpa. Glad to meet you. Hope you stay. Well, howdy, 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 nearly senior citizen here. I'm finally going to get this done. I've been trying to do this for like, oh, what time is it now? It's like 4.20 or something. I've been trying to do this for like four hours, and I've had computer crashes and just deciding that this ain't going to work because what I was trying to do didn't work. You see, I don't know 10 things about myself right off the top of my head. So I went through and I wrote a script because otherwise... I'm going to sit here going, uh, 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 even more than normal, and that's bad. So, I wrote out an entire script, but the problem is, when I'm reading it, I'm not making eye contact with you while I'm talking, and that just doesn't look right, because it's like, here, if I'm going, you no, know, I'm talking to you, and it just doesn't really seem right this way, does it? It seems wrong, off-putting, incorrect. So when you got eye contact, though, only I don't have a regular teleprompter where it, you know, it scrolls the words up past there so you can just read and you're staring into the omnipresent camera eye. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sit here and read it. And I'm going to cut out and go to amusing pictures when I look too creepy. And when I look normal and human, I'm going to keep that in. So, and my son's sitting over there, and the hamsters are sitting back there, and my in-laws are sitting in there. Well, in-law. My other in-laws are work. So, here we go. I'm going to start reading them. You see, it's like a book. It's an entire book. I had like 14 pages I wrote. Because I... Why use one word when 500 will do? So I wrote a huge book. Okay, here we go. It's, uh, number one, I smoke pot. I do. Marijuana. Weed. Ganja. Anyway, I went and bought this the other day. Uh, smelly it is really, really good for me. It's wonderful, and it does the trick for me, kills my pain, it's good. Because in Washington State, where I live, pot's now legal for recreational as well as medicinal use. And for those who use it recreationally, awesome. I've never had a problem with anyone else smoking marijuana. I'm very liberal about most everything. Uh, as long as you don't kill someone who doesn't want to be killed, I think most everything is fine and wonderful. Now, you just never hurt anyone physically, mentally, emotionally who does not consent to be hurt physically, emotionally, and in mentally, and all that. And then that's about the only limits that really there should be between consenting, understanding adults. But then I don't think, on a side note on that one, that sex is being done right unless it involves at least three people and the next morning at least one of them is a corpse. That is meaningful sex. Now as for pot, it is amazing. Way back in the 70s and such, pot was like 3 to 7 percent THC and everyone who smoked it got messed up. It didn't matter. Yeah, everyone just got high. You're a stone. No matter what, it was 
Good times, though, because I remember my high school pot smoking days quite fondly. Even when my parents caught me and threw most of an ounce away into the uh, fireplace. Thanks, Dad. Turns out that, you know, I would have been better smoking that all my life than becoming an alcoholic. But, now, these days, we have refined marijuana incredibly. It's usually about 20% THC these days, sometimes into the 30%. And even at that, the THC content doesn't mean you're going to get stoned. Because there's some of it, doesn't matter how much you smoke, you're not going to get stoned or high. You're going to get feeling good, you'll be comfortable, you'll be out of pain, but that's it. That's what it's for. And pot is amazing. If you are basing your feelings on what the government has been saying about pot, remember, they've been lying for almost a hundred years now. They still have pot listed as a Schedule 1. It's like the very few Schedule 1s. Pot's one of them. Where they say there is no medical value and it is thoroughly dangerous. Well, it's less dangerous than cigarettes, and it does stuff like cure cancer, and it uh, works for sleep apnea. It does all sorts of stuff. You know, so. It, it only now did they actually come out and say, oh, you're right, it, it does cure cancer. Yeah, it, like you've been saying for decades. Yeah, a little slow there, boys. And number two. I'm an amateur fiction writer. I've never sold anything for the last 40 years because I've been afraid of rejection and I've never sent anything in. I am a pretty good writer if I do listen to all the people that have read my material in writers groups over the decades and I've been thoroughly amazed and astonished at what I can do in a good way. I've been thinking of doing a fiction podcast, writing and reading some of my fiction and posting here or something somewhere where podcasts go. In the future, I may do that. Soon I may do one just for the channel here so people can thoroughly laugh at my hideous attempts in fiction. Or maybe I'm just talking it down so you have low expectations. And when you do read it, or hear it, it'll blow your socks off by not sucking. You'll have to take both my word for it and wait for the first practice podcast. Number three. Well, as I've more than alluded to, in fact, I've done a few vids on it. Uh, I am a widower. My wife died last May 19th, a little over a year ago. It almost killed me, honestly, and the main reason I'm doing as well as I am today is because of you. And it is. It's because of you, YouTube. YouTube got me outside of my head, and inside of my head I was dying from everything that was going on. My wife and I were in a tight personal orbit around each other. We loved each other intensely. Never once did we raise our voices to each other, even get pissed. No. We never fought in the 12 years we were married. We rarely argued. Yeah. But then she spent the last 10 years of her life dying slowly. We were clinging so hard to each other just to survive. There was no room for anything else. She died in the end of kidney failure. Her kidneys were so bad that they went first, but her heart was just a mass of scar tissue and smaller than it should have been for a woman her age. And her lungs were only at 33% capacity for someone they should have been for her age. It was horrible, but it was the kidneys. Yeah. Her kidneys so bad that they went first when she came home on a hospice to die. She was supposed to last for three to six months when it caught everyone, mostly her, by surprise when she died in less than two weeks. It's hard to talk with her without crying, so I'm rather amazed I'm doing it right now so well. Life without her has been colorless and gray, dragging and slow, but on the other hand, once I discovered YouTube and making videos and decided to come out of my head and try to live again, life's been getting more colorful. It's become more fun. Life is about only 80% gray and awful, 30% fun and light and YouTube, and 10% 
extremely bad arithmetic. Now number four, I spent 23 years as an active alcoholic until I entered my death spiral in 1999-2000. I couldn't eat anymore, I was so sick, and I was thinner than I am now, but I lost that weight faster through malnutrition. Not a good diet. I blew a .566 on the breathalyzer when I got to the rehab. Pretty scary. I remember that day entirely. I got sober in 2000, 2001, and I've been so ever since, barring a few very, very minor falls. I drank a beer a few years ago in anger. I drank a little bit after my wife died so that I would stop feeling, and then I stopped that when I needed to just a few weeks after. So I have been sober, I am sober, and I'm going to be sober because alcohol will kill me. My body can't take it and I will die. Plus, I've, I've never liked the taste of alcohol. Ugh. I drank beer and wine and I hated beer and I didn't like wine. I didn't drink hard alcohol right after I got out of the Air Force because that made me a mean drunk. Any other alcohol, I was the quiet drunk in the corner. I drank my pitcher or two while reading a book and then I quietly walked home when I was done. But when I drank vodka or such, I was the asshole that kicked in the door to enter the building. I knocked people aside on my way to the bar, I spilled my drink on you, and then I started a fight with you because you knocked my beer over. I didn't like that me, and so I very rarely drank that stuff, and thank goodness. That guy was a jerk, and even I didn't like it. Uh, number five, I've lost about 150 pounds since last June, about a year now. How did I do it? Simple, disease and anorexia, of course. When I had a tooth yanked, it hurt this side of my jaw bad, and I had an abscess somewhere in my jaw. The glands swole up bad. I could barely move my mouth. It hurt so much, and my white blood cell count was way up during this time. And that was the most important reason why I was throwing up all the time as well. With that abscess done there, ugh, I was sick as a dog. However, that's, you know, now that I can eat though, kinda, and we'll talk about that later, I don't eat very often still, and uh, that's the anorexia. I hate eating. I wish I didn't have to eat. Most food just, it's like eating tasteless and textureless styrofoam, so I don't do it. Sometimes from hunger, my stomach hurts so bad it's like a blowtorch held up against me. And I'll be at the store looking at food and I'm going, oh, I'm so hungry, I'll get this. And then I end up putting it all go back and then I go home with nothing. While the pain makes it hard to concentrate on anything else. But that goes away after a while and then you're okay on the not eating food front. So I'm trying to eat now. I need to stop losing weight because I'm still losing weight. 170 has to be my cutoff point. I don't want to think about going any lower and I'm at like 183 now. So I gotta stop here pretty soon. Number six. I bought my very first computer of Commodore VIC-20 in 1982 and then about a Four months later, I bought a Commodore 64, because <laughs> the VIC-20 kind of sucks. Great machine, but compared to even the Commodore 64, blue. Uh, let's see. I stuck with the C64 for ages, and when Commodore came out with the Commodore 128, I bought that. It had twice the power of the C64, and you could turn it into C64 mode, where it just turned into a C64, or it could be the 128 with just, it was nice machine, it was really nice. Um, let's see, let's see. Later on, when I had money, I bought an Amiga 1000, and then after that, I bought an A500. And then when that broke in 1993, I bought my first IBM PC compatible clone. Uh, 
which is what we called them back then. They were clones. Because there were IBM computers, and then there were clones. There were no Dells, no gateways. There was Apple that made Apple stuff. There was IBM that made the IBM computers. And then there were just these little fly-by-night junk companies that would come up with IBM PC-compatible clones. So. I bought a clone in 1993. And then from 1993 to 2000, when I finally crashed and burned my alcohol of them, I built and upgraded my computers from scratch. I never bought one out of the box that I didn't immediately just tear apart, start upgrading in parts immediately. When I went into rehab in 2000, that's when I lost track of hardware, and now everything is all way past my knowledge. I've worked with ID, IDE drives and IDE controller cards and the cables, and but suddenly there's a SATA drive, and what the hell is a SATA? I used to have an AMD 939-pin CPU and motherboard, and what is it in this thing? I, I got no idea. I know there's an XFS motherboard, and it's an Intel. Pass that. Yeah. I knew what an SS3 SSD drive was when I first heard of it because I've been following flash uh, drive RAM and ROM technology uh, my own just as a hobby for well ever since I knew about flash drives. So that was cool, and so I'm a geek. I'm a nerd behind these eyes and fluffy hair. Number seven. Bum bum bum. I used to collect comic books, and I wish I still had the money to do so. I wouldn't buy comics. I just wish I had the kind of money anymore. I, I quit before I crashed and burned for sad, sad reasons. I had been collecting since high school and I had approximately 10,000 comics. I had about 30 comic book boxes full, about 10,000 comics. And then uh, I ended up selling all of them, except for a stack maybe, maybe this tall. And uh, I drank every bit of it. Here's some of the things I did keep them. Like here's a collection of a comic that came out, it was Stig's Inferno. That one's funny as hell. Goofy's all get out. That one's really good though. Uh, here's one of my my old special Marvel edition Thor. As you can see, number three, September. Woo! I used to have a Fantastic Four number. Uh, God, it's like number four. So this is nothing. Then for any of you that have ever read the Miracle Man series with Alan Moore and all that, I used to have the first 12 or so. These are all I got left, just these first three. I used to collect this beautiful stories for ugly children. Very, very odd series. Mostly words done by a writer and a painter. Then, this is something that I thought was really cool and I really liked it. It's only the first ten issues, though. It was Solar Man of the Atom Image Comics by Jim Shooter. And, you know, I never really had a lot... Oh, Valiant Comics, I meant, by Jim Shooter. And I never had a lot of respect for Jim Shooter until I read that. That was incredible. I mean, he did Marvel's Secret Wars. He went on to do that crap to this crap, which wasn't crap. Then, to round this one off, I've also got a one of these collected uh, Lobo series things with uh, Scott Olive. He collected Lobo, the last Zarnian. I was really into Lobo for a long time. You stab all the Lobo stuff. And then here's a bunch of collected uh, Lobo's Greatest Hits, where they take all the old Lobo stuff. And then the joke behind this one, this is the collected wisdom of Lobo it's blank there's no wisdom he's he's not wise he's just a thug and they glorified it and went with it so that was the uh, and of course this book not rep for geeks wimps dweebs weenies and those with a delicate constitution definitely not me 
So that's all that remains of my comic book collecting days here at 52 years old. Ugh, I gotta fix those up later. Right, Kip, if you could do me a favor, favor, not a paper, favor, and put those like up around the table, please. I used to collect Marvel comics only. From high school onward, base guy, it was Marvel only. And then through the years, I started buying more DCs, more alternatives, less Marvels, until eventually I was only buying DC and alternative slash underground comics, and I, I looked down on Marvel entirely. I still kind of do. That's why I'm kind of sad that it's all the Marvel comics stuff that's so big in the theaters right now. I want DC to get bigger. Okay, well, number eight. And talk about being a geek. Back when I was in high school, I made this print fanzine. I think it's this one. This print fanzine, because back then there was no internet. Here's the other one, too. This one's even older. This, That one I just showed you was one I did when I got out of the Air Force. This one I did when I was in high school. It's called Dasporia. Ooh, I knew a pretty good artist. He did that for me. I uh, knew uh, through going to a world con, I'd actually met a... Uh, a writer, Mac Reynolds, who died not long afterward, unfortunately, but he sent me a story for this, and he was a nice guy. We talked a lot, and uh, it's got stories and stuff like that. It was back when I was 18, but oh, and I might as well do this one too. This is the Adventures of Lemonhead. This is a comic book I did with uh, like four panels per page. Ooh, it was high tech. Uh, it was very popular, actually. I think, see, five cents up there? I think I actually made a quarter once. But if this has the collected four previous issues and the current one of this lemon, or this tragedy, this duck. I might, I'm going to have to show you what this stuff is later on. This is like, this stuff's funny as hell. Like, um, still I... And it says, I did die when I fought the brain gobblers from the planet X. I died and fought my way back. Which, of course, has never happened, folks. Little stuff like that. It's funny. Okay. And, you see, back then, there was no internet. If you wanted to make anything and had to be seen, you had very few options. Print was your best option. You could make a fanzine, which was a fan magazine. You made it all up page by page on paper, and then you either typed it with a typewriter onto a mimeograph stencil, if you did mimeo, or if you really had money, you went to a copy shop, and back then there was no Kinko's. Copies from usually like 10 to 25 cents a piece. You also had machines that would burn an image onto a mimeograph stencil that you would then type around, and a stencil was a two-sheet object with a waxy front and a cardboard thing in the back. It was held together at the top. You fed it into a typewriter, and then the side you typed on was waxy, and when the key hit the wax, it physically pushed the wax aside, leaving just fibers there. Just a fiber-filled hole. And the back sheet was a thicker piece of cardboard so that the wax got pushed to the side and not into the roller bar of your typewriter and make a horrible mess. Okay, and then you fit the style that you then fit the stencil onto the mimeograph machine, and I was lucky to have to have a gestetner. You put your tube of ink onto the machine and then you set your stack of paper into the machine, and then you could operate it by hand with a crank or by electricity, and have it just go chung 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 on its own. Uh, I preferred to hand crank. The ink squeezed through the fiber-filled holes and onto each sheet of paper, and there's also the root of an atha, an amateur press association. This is like the equivalent of a social media website, which is true. Social media website, except in print form. You only made enough copies as there were members, and you sent your zine off to the central mailer. He or she put each zine into a final book form and then mailed off each book to each member. Your zine, in this case, was to produce something original and then do Ego Boo. 
and ego boo was when you went through and you did comments on each per person's previous issue's contribution. I created an app way back at the end of high school called Junior Apple 5. It was an offshoot of a larger, way more popular app called Apple 5, which was renamed Imagine Apple some years later. It died, as if not all, 99% of all apps have done. Although there is an Imagine Apple group still on Facebook of all the old members, life changes. And number nine. I don't know ten things about me. I'm not interesting enough to have ten things known about me. But I have two children by blood through my wife, and another child who is my wife's son by a previous relationship, but I've raised him since he was five and a half years old, and I've been in his life before that, and I consider him my son, damn it. Uh, I have a twelve-year-old daughter whose name I is typically more used by that of a person of color, and I hate that stupid phrase, but... Anyway, I'd like to tell you what it is, but I have a sudden fear of telling the Internet in general about uh, my 12-year-old daughter and her name. Well, I'm the reason she's got the name, as she is Lily White like I am. Which, by the way, I should mention that while I am Lily White, since my people on one side were the Fishbelly Clan, and my people on the other side were uh, the White Bread Clan, and uh, together I am the offspring, an even paler new clan, the uh, Lily White Clan. Uh, it's pure accident of skin, it means nothing. I don't even think there should be uh, an issue of a division among people called race. It's skin color. And who gives a sack full of blood smeared hammers what color someone's skin is? It's impossible to ignore someone's skin color. Yes, it's part of your skin. After all, it's part of your identity. But I don't think anyone should be judged in any way, shape, or form because of their skin color. Talk about pointless. We have all these other important reasons to hate and kill each other, and we're wasting our time on skin color? Give me the important reasons I should hate my neighbor and want him dead. You know, don't waste my time with skin color. It's a stupid reason to hate someone. Religion? Maybe. Skin color? Nah. Nah, anyway. I like the name that we gave her, and at the time that we heard it, it was a Native American Indian context. They did a, a, a poll, they found that among um, those who are Indians, and they preferred to be called Indian instead of Native American, overwhelmingly they just wanted to be known as Indian and not Native American, so... Oh, I got a message from Cola Pops. Hi, Cola Pops. I'm going to be coming in there soon. <laughs> anyway, I like the name, and at the time we heard it, it was that. I can't remember what tribe, and I can't. It's very embarrassing, but the name meant Flowing River, and we liked it. Now, my son's middle name is Gowan, and I don't have nearly the same fear of telling you my son's name as Ab Tab telling you my 12-year-old daughter's name. Anyway, that's his middle name, too. Now, is this paranoia or common sense? Anyway, Gallon's a good name. I like it. Well, who knows if he does? That's... Not like it. That's good, but ultimately, it wasn't even important. But still, I'm glad. It's a good name. And now I'm gonna answer Cold Pop, so I'll be back to everybody. Number 10. Well, this one's less about me and more what I've done since starting to come out of my shell. A shell that YouTube cracked so I could start to get free of the grand, awful existence my life has evolved into. In the months, I have bought these so I can play with my kids and maybe join or create a local gaming group. Now, I guess the local gaming group would probably be for geezers, <laughs> I guess, but who knows? I mean, uh,. Every Friday night, my nephew, he and his friends, they have game night. They gather on Fridays and play board games. That's awesome. 
who knows, maybe they'd let a, an old man play, hard to say. Um, he still does have one of mine. I need to get it back from him. It's called Castle Panic. It's a... It's a board game, tower defense, video game adaption kind of thing. You play co-op by all players against the invading bad guys who are played just by the rules. No. Over. I've been printing out also copies of the uh, old style generational things. You know, like um, the 1970s old school role playing games, like first generation D&D. There's been a real old school renaissance happening where people are putting out tons of free games in the vein of the really old school stuff. And some of them are really freaking awesome. Like Labyrinth Lords is one that I've printed out. There's also Minotaurs and Mazes and all those. One of them also I've got that it's um, not a printed out one. It's Tunnels and Trolls, if you heard about that. I want to try and try and try 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 I want to try them with uh, Tunnels and Trolls as well. But, anyway, now that I've talked about that, now to talk about these. Because one of the things I bought was a Flux. Yeah, Zombie Flux. It's a Flux is a weird board game. It's pretty crazy. This one adds zombies because, hey, guess who likes zombies? Me. And guess my son here. Yeah. Break it. He likes zombies too. Yeah. This one is a... Uh, Cthulhu game with all of the stuff collected in the Arkham Museum. The uh, elder beings from Beyond Dimensions are trying to come through using the artifacts gathered together. And it's up to you and investigators to risk your lives and sanity to try to gather up all the pieces of the elder sign to block the entrance of the ancient one and save all of humanity. And it doesn't really have a board. You create the board with uh, cards and pieces. Awesome. You can hold that, please. Betrayal at House on the Hill. This one's more of a haunted house type game. You also create the board as you're playing. This is like um, three to six players. And it has to be at least three because when you hit the correct haunt, one of the players becomes a traitor and you can only win by defeating the game and defeating the traitor. Ooh, so pretty cool I thought. Looking forward to that one. Then there's, we played some of this one. Dead of Winter. This one is a zombie game. It uh, takes place after the zombie apocalypse in the middle of winter. This one's a very grim game. It, uh, the board is not really a board. A lot of it's played, you know, on little, little sections there. But it's got little. They tell you to take out the very grim, uh, role-playing things if you don't want to have grim and really nasty. So we did that. And we still played, and what they don't consider grim is this. In the game, everybody takes food, but you also have uh, survivors who are useless survivors. But if you take a look at the tokens, they're children. And the children take up resources, but they can't help. And one of the cards was, someone in the, the colony says, you know, we don't have a lot of food, and we need everybody to be helping. We have people here that we're feeding that aren't helping the colony. And so the question becomes, do you turn them out where they're all going to die? Or do you suck it up and keep them and keep paying for them as food? That's grim as hell. Oh, I'm afraid to look at the ones that they consider grim when they let that one in. Thank you. This one is Zombicide Season 2. I got this one on sale a bit ago. Um, it's normally a hundred dollar game. It was like half off. That was the only reason that they were even able to sell it there. They're not going to be getting any more of these at the game store because people look at them and go, Oh, a hundred dollars. That only didn't cost so much. 
but this is season two. I kind of want season one. It's just another board game. It takes place not in a prison and it's compatible with this. And they also have another one which is uh, Toxic City Mall as a third place, adds a different kind of zombie to it. With this one, you're trying to create Ah, uh, bloody speaking hand. You're trying to create your own board, and then the zombies show up, and as you move, there's not very many, and they're pretty weak. As your characters get stronger, more zombies show up. Popper stronger zombies show up. You've got to get from one end of the board to escape. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Thank you very, very much. Okay, now I've talked about how uh, I wanted to do the pen and paper things. So, this has been 10 things that you now know about me that you might not have known before. Did you care? Probably not. But that's okay, I got tagged, so uh, 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 I got to do it anyway. Uh, hopefully this 200 hour video didn't uh, bore you too much. It's not really that. It's already been 40 minutes though. Um, I don't know three to five people to tag, so I'm going to tag, uh, and if you've already been tagged before, then just of course ignore this. I mean, you're going to ignore it anyway. You're not even going to watch this far to find out who's tagged. Uh, Scream Screen, Ega, Spin to Win Gamer, you're all tagged. Uh, thank you very much. I'll see you all later. This is a huge video. Maybe I'm going to edit it down so it's only like 36 minutes. Talk to you later. See you on the flip side.